Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Herman. And I'm Patrick O'Brien. So um, we have the distinct honor of being the people who were given by marketing the longest title of any uh, presentation at reInvent. <laughs> title of today's presentation is How Amazon Scales Infrastructure to Handle Billions of Transactions on Prime Day. Um, and before we even start, I want to talk about the first word, how. Uh, I'm not going to be talking today about uh, how our applications are architected, how we use various pieces of AWS to enable various parts of the Amazon website. There's a bunch of different tech talks going on today and tomorrow uh, that are going to get into the details of Amazon's architecture. So if that's what you're interested in, uh, I don't want to waste your time. Patrick doesn't want to waste your time. So feel free to sneak out and go find yourself another presentation that's going to hit home. Uh, what we are going to talk about is how AWS lets us meet the business challenge of a massive event like Prime Day. Uh, we want you to walk away with an understanding of the lessons that we've learned running large-scale events for many years uh, and the best practices that you can leverage when you're planning your own high-velocity event. So hopefully that's going to be of interest to you because that's what we're going to be talking about. So to start out with, um, at your company, you've got some kind of an IT team, a cloud capacity team, a cloud center of excellence, uh, and that group are the people who are your liaisons with AWS. They work with your company to make sure that your needs are met, and they interface with your AWS account team or your technical account, technical account managers uh, to make sure that your company and AWS are operating together smoothly. That's like the two of us. So I run the capacity management team at Amazon. I represent Amazon as a customer of Amazon Web Services. And so all of the different Amazon businesses, from the Amazon.com website to Kindle and Alexa, uh, Amazon Instant Video, Amazon Music, and even some of the AWS teams themselves, they all work through me to coordinate how they get access to AWS. Uh, and then Patrick here. And I'm the strategic account manager for the AWS account team. So Amazon.com itself is actually my customer. So I'm responsible for the capacity that powers all of the software and services at Amazon. Uh, and specifically, I look after planning which is uh, looking into the growth of our business. We take scaling forecasts from different lines of business uh, that look at the organic growth of our business and how, how we're moving forward. Um, but we also look at new projects, new product introductions, uh, technology migrations, and international expansions, and the budgetary impacts of all of those. And I take all of that data and use it both to communicate with the Amazon business, but also to share with uh, those plans with AWS so that AWS understands how Amazon is going to be growing. Next, I own financial controllership. This is about ensuring that the money that we spend in the cloud is money that was reviewed and approved within our financial plan. Uh, I like to describe it as ensuring that every dollar of usage has an owner who's accountable for the productivity of that dollar. Uh, then I own fulfillment and readiness. And what this is about is making sure that as Amazon is growing, we're always ahead of the curve in terms of having the capacity secured that we need for all the software teams. So that none of the software teams ever come up short uh, because we weren't taking care of their needs. And then last, uh, I have a responsibility that's uh, dealing with uh, emergencies and rapid, rapid response events. And so that's where we find creative solutions for uh, emergency scaling or capacity problems that we might be having. And often that takes the form of, how do I optimize the investment I've already made in RIs I've purchased but maybe we're no longer using uh, when we're trying to deal with something in emergency rather than going and buying more capacity from EC2. And I'm the single point of escalation for all things AWS. So I'm responsible for Amazon's experience, making sure it's easy, cost effective, and efficient. I'm responsible for strategy, so I act as the strategic partner, working on long-term planning adoption. I work on roadmaps, narratives, financials, adoption strategies. I work across Amazon's technology divisions as well, working with over 45 different executives and hundreds of different teams. I work with our solution architects, uh, helping to develop long-term solutions and using best practices. And last but not least, I work with the AWS support team um, and the technical account managers to help them with cases and plan peak events. So I want to start out a little bit just telling you about the history of Prime Day and how we came to be where we are today. So back in March of 2015, Jeff Wilkie, who's the CEO of the Amazon consumer business, or Amazon.com, if you will, uh, he had this idea that we should have a sale for our Prime members, um, to thank them for their loyalty, to reward them for being Prime members, have a little fun, and encourage more people to join Prime. So he sat down with his leadership team, and they started talking about it, and they decided they liked this idea. 
And you know, when we stopped and thought about it as a company, like, this wasn't a big, big deal for us. We're very comfortable with large events. We do Black Friday and Cyber Monday every year. We know how to handle a big sale. And when you think of an event like Black Friday and Cyber Monday, this might be what pops into your head. But at Amazon, we look at it a little more like this. You're looking at one of our fulfillment centers, uh, and what we see is thousands and thousands of items that need to be picked, packed, and shipped to our customers to fulfill their orders. So they came up with this idea in March, uh, and we had about three months to get ready. And the economists from around the company and the business people got together. They started figuring out what inventory could we get, what did we want to do, what were we going to sell, how big could this be? Uh, and through that process, they came up with a projection that we should see about a 21% increase in sales over a normal day uh, in July. And this seemed pretty reasonable to us. Uh, there were a couple of reasons. One is, this sale was for our prime members only, and that's just a subset of our shopping population. Next, it was happening on a random day in July, and we were keeping it really quiet until the last minute. So really, there was no hype around it. Customers didn't know this was coming. Uh, it was going to be a bit of a surprise. So we weren't expecting the huge uplift that we would see with uh, the hype behind something like a Cyber Monday. All seemed pretty reasonable. So before I jump into what actually happened, I want to take a look at three normal days of orders. Uh, what you see right here is our Japan website in the three days leading up to uh, Prime Day 2015. And the graph itself is showing you orders per minute. Um, I could extend this graph to seven days or 70 days. It looked just like this. Our Japan shoppers have a very regular pattern. Uh, they get up in the morning, they do a little bit of shopping. You see that scale up starting on the left. Um, then it kind of flattens out. There's a little dip. Uh, it'll tend towards flat through most of the day. And then what our Japan shoppers do is they come home in the evenings and their shopping is way up. And we get a lot of orders and then a very steep drop off as they go to bed. And this just happens every single day. So we take that plan and we layer in what our prime day projections were going to be. So we're thinking about how many orders are we going to see? We're going to kick off Prime Day right at midnight, the very beginning of the day, right when the orders are really dying down on the Japan site. So we knew we'd have time to react if anything was off. Um, and with us being a global company, the advantage of this is we got to look at what was going to happen in Japan about 18 hours before it hit in the US, uh, which is our much bigger site. And so we had the opportunity to react. So back in Seattle, we're all glued to our monitors and our metrics, uh, excited to see what would happen. And here's what happened. The first minute. So traffic surged up over 100% of our expectation. Short dip, and then it spiked again to 120%. And then from there, it calmed down to a mere 95% above our projections for the evening. So it was at this point that we realized, we're not ready. <laughs> We've got 16 hours to go from the start of Prime Day in the United States, and only eight hours to go before it kicks off in Europe. And it's at this point that pagers started going off all over the company. My team jumped into action trying to figure out, first of all, how do we make the most of what we have? So the first thing we did was we asked software teams, descale everything you don't need. If it's not running a production workload, turn it off. Dev environments, test, gamma, beta, turn it off. Maximize the amount of reserved instances that we have that we can throw at production. Next, we went out and raided pools of hardware that teams had acquired in advance of product launches. If your product wasn't live and you had software installed and you were testing and getting ready, turn it off. Give it back. We're going to need it. And the next thing we did was we called our support team in AWS and said, please let AWS know we're going to be hitting on-demand in a big, big way in a few hours. So let's jump into what this looked like. I'm going to show you uh, US East One, which is our biggest site where we host the US consumer website, Amazon.com. This chart bears a little study, so bear with me. We're going to start with the blue line on the bottom. I'm showing you orders per minute, again, like that Japan one. Uh, this is the eight days leading up to Prime Day in the US. And again, you see a very regular pattern. Our US uh, shoppers follow this pattern all the time. Um, what you'll notice is it starts with a Monday. Uh, that's always our busiest day of the week. It drops off ever so slightly all week long. Uh, on Friday, tails off in the afternoon. People don't shop so much. They go and enjoy their Saturday. Uh, Sunday starts to pick back up, and it's Monday all over again. And this pattern just repeats. The green line up above is showing you the number of EC2 reserved instances that we were running. So in the final week leading up to Prime Day, we were still scaling up and getting ready. We're adding more instances and preparing for our event. We kind of flatlined there around the weekend, doing a little fine tuning, but we mostly thought we were ready. Here's what happened. The <laughs> orange line here is showing you the 21% uplift we were expecting. Uh, and you can see the orders graph exceeds that by a little bit. Um, 
the green line takes off vertically 18 hours before, maybe 16 hours before uh, the order started climbing. So that was us turning on every reserved instance we had. Everything we could descale, everything we had, everything we could find, we lit it up. And then we immediately started launching on demand with EC2. Uh, and you can see in the graph that we continued chasing that order spike throughout the morning. And as soon as the orders crested and started to drop back off again, we flatlined on the number of instances we were running. And then we caught our breath for the rest of the day and the day that followed. And then we started descaling and turning off all of that on demand capacity, plus all of the stuff we had raided from every team in the company and started giving it back to them. And you can see our orders graph returns to that same old pattern, back to normal. Uh, so we were able to do this for a few reasons. First, uh, Amazon embraced microservices a long, long time ago, and that's part of our DNA. Amazon is made up of thousands of loosely coupled software teams and systems that can all operate independently. This means we didn't need some central orchestration team or a release management function or a bunch of project managers to make this all happen. We just sent out the word and said, everybody scale up and people were able to react on their own independently, adding capacity to their, to their uh, software systems. The other thing that worked in our advantage was that for us, dev, test, prod, those are software configurations. We don't have physical separation in network or firewalls. We don't have any moats or walls around of those things that prevent us from fungibly moving capacity around. So we were able to take dev instances, turn them off, light them right back up as production instances, and have them take uh, traffic from our external customers. So those things made it easy for us to reuse capacity we had internally and then rely on the elasticity of AWS. So now your experience as a customer, if you shopped that day, might have been a little different. Uh, AWS is elastic, but our fulfillment centers and our inventory isn't. So the customer response was super huge, and we sold out of all of our deals in the very first few hours of the day. We had to get scrappy and put all sorts of crazy things on sale just to have something for sale on Prime Day. Uh, we took a little ribbing on social media about that, and frankly, we deserved it. Uh, we managed to get a few good laughs out of it as well. Um, so here you've got uh, a couple of my favorites. Um, I think any of you who have kids recognize that first one when you go to get a snack and uh, someone's put the empty back in the cabinet for you. Uh, and I also really like this one from Matthew Morgan, uh, talking about us raiding a Rite Aid in a Circuit City to come up with some stuff for sale. It wasn't far from the truth. <laughs> so we made it. Sure, we were massively underscaled for what happened. Yes, we sold out of good deals and had to come up with scrappy ones. But we did what we do best as a company. We were resilient, we were creative, we love our customers, and we did everything we could to make a good day for them. And we leaned heavily on the elasticity of AWS to save the day. So we got through the first one. What happens now? Despite the issues we had, we knew we were really onto something here. It was a super popular day. We took a beating in social media, but our sales numbers were through the roof. So in January of 2016, we sat down and started talking about Prime Day number two. We wanted to have more deals, more inventory, more happy customers, and definitely no Prime Day fail. Uh, but Amazon likes to be peculiar, and so instead of trying to avoid the garage sale nature of what happened in 2015, we decided to embrace it. We launched a new category we call Weird and Wonderful, and our customers had a lot of fun with the crazy things we put on sale. Prime Day 2016 was uh, a wild success as well. We were up nearly 130% over the first Prime Day, so now our customers knew this was coming. We've got a little bit of hype behind it. Um, the biggest thing that we learned in, wow, that's not working the way I expected at all. Where are we at? The biggest thing we learned was that our third party sellers wanted to go all in on Prime Day. And so in 2017, uh, we expanded that as well. We had a lot more third party engagement. We had more inventory available. Uh, and to top that all off, we launched in all 13 of the countries where we offer Prime. And last but not least, we came up with a new idea as well to let small businesses in on it. They wanted to see increases in, uh, in their sales as well. So um, with all of those things, we went on for this year's Prime Day uh, to yet more success. Prime members purchased seven times uh, more Echo devices than they did the previous year. We had our biggest day in history, 60% growth year on year, tens of millions of shoppers, uh, tremendous success. So um, our business metrics were off the charts, uh, but our AWS metrics are pretty exciting too. So let's talk about the AWS metrics for a second. So just to give you an idea of the sheer size we're talking about, here's some examples. I mean, Amazon used over 80 different AWS services working across 200 different teams, and we used 24,866 AWS accounts. 
Um, electric, elastic block store alone jumped 52 petabytes, a 50% year-over-year increase. DynamoDB requests were across all Amazon sites, the fulfillment centers, and Alexa totaled 3.34 trillion, peaking at 12.9 million requests per second without breaking a sweat. And thanks to the elasticity of our services, Amazon.com was able to scale rapidly after Prime Day instead of being stuck with all that hardware. So uh, Prime Day 2017, 38% bigger than uh, the Q4 peak of the previous year, which was our previous uh, set of records. Um, what I wanted you to see here is how, over the course of the last three years, uh, things have grown for us. So you're looking at the number of uh, EC2 instances that we're running over time. Uh, you can see the three holiday seasons going back to 2014. That's our Black Friday and Cyber Monday season, uh, as well as the first Prime Day and the two that followed. Um, what you see here is that the spikes get bigger and the window gets shorter. We're getting more efficient at scaling up fast, more efficient at scaling back down. The elasticity that we require for these events is something we never could have done before AWS. Back in 2004, when we were doing this sort of thing, before AWS existed, we were just buying tons of computers and putting them in our data centers and trying to get them all installed in time. Uh, and that was just straight up compute. Now we're scaling not just in our EC2 instances, but on all of the services that AWS has to offer. For instance, if you compare one week before this year's Prime Day, so the, the previous week of July 2017, uh, our Amazon mobile analytics usage on Prime Day increased 1,661%. Our use of CloudWatch metrics increased 400%, uh, and DynamoDB served 56 billion extra requests on Prime Day than the previous week. So we're able to take advantage of the elasticity of all of these services to make these events happen. I wrote this slide uh, several weeks before Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and I was really, really nervous about jinxing it. Um, <laughs> but we had three prime days, three holiday seasons, zero outages. We're doing something right, and we want to share that with you. So what makes Amazon.com unique from our other customers? Well, we're partnering with a customer here that has over 18,000 developers around the world. As we mentioned before, they're using 80 AWS services, and they have using thousands of AWS features. They're also highly decentralized. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, Amazon runs more like a loose federation of independent companies rather than a large monolithic corporation, and they're all building separate microservices. And so to make it successful, AWS realized that we needed a new mechanism to prepare for customers of such size and complexity. Infrastructure event readiness is really about planning and preparing for the anticipated significant events that large, have a large impact on your business. So, AWS support created an engagement mechanism that we call the Infrastructure Event Management, or IEM. Investing time and resources to plan and prepare using AWS experts by your side results in elastic scalability, reduced risk, increased acceleration, improved performance, and high availability. So let's walk, in, walk into the timeline for a moment for an event. Um, first, let's talk about planning. For Amazon.com, an initiative this size and scale starts over six months ahead with business strategy and forecasting across 200 different teams. Amazon plans their approach with vendors, third-party sellers, business stakeholders, and finance. The plans are then refined by thousands of individuals and individual software teams. These plans become inputs into their forecasts um, over five months ahead, and the account team then shares all that data within AWS so that we can do our own planning across all the different AWS services. Amazon also establishes a cadence of recurring meetings with all key infrastructure components of the web service. This includes key technical account teams, partners, vendors, and the AWS account team itself. So how do we prepare for a scaling event of this size and scope? Lots and lots of prep work. The, the primary activity we perform is what we call um, well-architected reviews. I assume everyone's familiar with this concept. After working with thousands of customers, AWS solution architects have identified a series of core strategies and best practices for the cloud, and our AWS solution architects can measure arch your architecture against best practices and call out any alignment issues. We also recommend that you uh, perform a few activities beforehand, such as build an event runbook and document every single step. Um, engage all of your partners and vendors. Identify any risks and document them in your plan. Update your production operational runbooks. And of course, update all your monitoring dashboards. 
So I want to do a double click on the final months leading up to our big event. What you see here in red is a uh, number of EC2 instances, so familiar to the graphs I've shown you before. Uh, you can see a nice little steady increase, and this is just a natural growth of our business, uh, keeping up with new customers, new products, all of the things that we're constantly doing at Amazon. So we're two months before the big event. We're in normal growth mode. Uh, at this point, we start a weekly readiness review. Every tier one service owner in the company is required to attend, along with senior leaders and people who've been involved in big outages and big events at Amazon before, people who've been there and done that and who know what to look for. We get together once a week and we start discussing the latest forecast for the event, the event calendar, and we review new features, migrations, changes that are underway that aren't yet complete so that everybody's on the same page where our risks are and what we're doing as we head in. Next, six weeks before the event, this is where we start scaling up and tuning and testing thousands of individual services. Each service owner, each software team is responsible for their own readiness. They own taking care of their scaling, getting their software stack ready, getting the final deployments done, bug fixes, you name it. They get their stuff ready. And so what you see during this time is hyper growth where we're adding lots and lots of reserved instances and all of our teams are preparing for the event. At this point, we go to about three times a week for our readiness reviews. And we start with a process we call service roll call. So every one of these major services at the company uh, reports out red, yellow, green for our next milestone, which is full end-to-end -end site testing. Anybody who's showing yellow or red status, we do a deep dive right there in the meeting with lots of people who are there engaged and ready to help. So we're able to make sure that everybody and everything is going to come together uh, for our next step. Now we're three weeks to go before the big event. The individual services are all fairly stable. They've all scaled up. We switch now to daily readiness reviews. And we begin multiple company-wide coordinated game days. This is our term for end-to-end -end testing of our full stack. We simulate the traffic we expect to see, the orders we expect to see, uh, and we push that website stack to see how it's going to perform at load. There are also smaller game days that are done on a per segment basis. You can imagine our checkout pipeline or our mobile ordering pipeline uh, or our Alexa ordering. Those teams will be doing their own special game days just focused on the things they're worried about as well. These tests expose weaknesses in our services. Bugs get fixed, services get tuned, and services have last minute scaling. And you can see here on the graph, we continue to add our eyes at a little more relaxed pace than we were the prior weeks, but we're still tuning up all of the weak spots in the system and everyone is pitching in to help when services are in distress. We'll loan hardware from one team to another, we'll loan engineers, whatever is needed to make sure we all come together. Now it's a week to go before the event, and we're relatively ready. Things are stable, we're continuing our daily readiness reviews, we're following up on any final actions from our game day testing, but for the most part, everybody has their final capacity and scaling is complete. Uh, in fact, if you look really closely at that graph, you might notice that at the end it tails down ever so slightly, and that's where uh, teams who have a little extra time and things are going really well, they'll go scale down anything they can that they don't need, and that frees up just that little bit extra capacity for us, and it saves us a little bit of money. So now it's time for the big show. It's the day of the event. A few hours before the event starts, we start a process we call the war room. For the next 30 hours, we're going to operate as though the website has experienced an outage. All of the owners and their teams are on a live call, coordinated in multiple rooms across the company, all on a big, big conference bridge. Uh, we have one of our outage event leaders run the call, and we do hourly health check-ins on all the services. Any service that's starting to struggle reports in yellow or red, and all of the engineers we need are there ready to dive in and figure out what's going on. Uh, a key part of this is the teams all understand their dependencies, and if a service like Search announces that they're starting to tip over, other services know what that's going to mean to them, and they can all chime in either with how they can help reduce the traffic on the search uh, fleet, or uh, be ready for maybe taking on more hardware if search is going to have to scale up. Everything we do is done live on this call. It's tracked in a massive trouble ticket. So that we have a full timeline of everything that was done, who was involved, the data we used to make the decisions, all our metrics and graphs are posted into that ticket, the problems and resolutions get tracked. And as things kick off, we're going to find hotspots. We're going to find bottlenecks. And uh, we use the elasticity of AWS in the, during the event to take care of those. So you can see on our graph, we scale up uh, and we take on-demand capacity to meet the final needs that happen on, on the day of the event. And in addition to that as well, AWS support is on, on the call as well and present in case any issues come up on the AWS side too. 
When it's all over, we go home, we get a little bit of sleep, and then the next day the descaling begins. Over the next week, teams will be turning off all of the things they no longer need and returning to normal operation. And in fact, at this, this point, now that we've been doing this for a few years, we've gotten to the point where you can see after descaling, we're right back to where we would have been had that event not happened. We got right back to the runway, run rate that we were already on. So finally, the most important component of an infrastructure event management is the post-event analysis. Um, every peak event is an opportunity to observe and to improve for the next one. Um, we recommend you descale your resources, such as EC2 and RDS, that were scaled up during the prep phase. Um, reset your service limits. Uh, make sure that service limits protect you and your costs by preventing excess service outages. Collect all the data and look for patterns, trends, and problem areas. Also, do a detailed cost analysis of the event. Um, and last but not least, do a post-mortem. Review and document what went well and what didn't. Um, did you meet your success criteria? What were the lessons learned? What can be improved for the next event? So there is the conclusion of the main presentation. We've got a few tips we want to share at the very end, but we thought we'd take some Q&A before we jump into those. Uh, there's microphones at the front on these two sides. We need you to come up and use those microphones so that we get the audio for the recording as well. So if there's any questions, we're ready. I'm going to make you go to a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys use Prime Day as a way to test new features, like with the NLB you guys just released? Do you use that on Prime Day before you release it to the public? It's a great question. Uh, we actually, so, so Amazon.com, uh, sort of the, the non-AWS side of the business, operates independently from the AWS side of the business. They have their own leadership team. They have a different set of customers, uh, their own priorities. Um, but they act as a very large customer of AWS. And so Amazon.com does beta test many, many of the things that uh, AWS launches. However, uh, we don't ever want to put our customer experience at risk, and so we don't use, as far as I know anyway, uh, we don't use any beta products during our big events. Um, can you share the cost of uh, scaling up of everything compared to a normal day during that day specifically? I don't think we can. Yeah, I, don't we can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish that we could. Uh, what, I, what I can tell you is, um, one, we rely heavily on reserved instances, and you can see that in the graph that we showed. Uh, and we try to only use on-demand for, for those peaks and the unexpected parts of the traffic that we see. Um, we use the RI product very heavily, one, because it gives us the cost savings, but two, because it gives us the capacity guarantee that ensures us that we're able to keep our applications up and functioning no matter what happens with our customers during the day. I mean, I think we can say that uh, we treat, as he mentioned before, we treat Amazon.com as an enterprise account. And so for Prime Day, we had over a million EC2 incidents, so you can kind of do the math there. <laughs> yeah, so on that, the, um, so Amazon's a big customer, right? And the number of instances was huge, and the spike was huge. So from an EC2 AWS point of view, um, I'm curious about what portion of the you know, global compute capacity that is. And does this become an event for you to either plan or sort of permanently scale your actual hardware, because in the end, there's real hardware somewhere. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just magically, you know, the one, one side of the, the convo here was, it just sort of magically comes into play because you're a customer of AWS. But on the other side, I'm thinking, if I'm trying to support Amazon, is this an event where I just buy more hardware and, and provision it, and you know, how is that? play into the whole global capacity? No, it's a great question as well. And um, there's a couple of things about it. One is uh, the various different Amazon.com sites, whether uh, that's the .com site for the US is our biggest site, but we've got multiple sites in Europe that run out of uh, EU West One. Mm -hmm. uh, our Japan site actually runs out of US West One. So those different sites all scale independently, of course. They have different sets of customers. So the amount we add in those different places varies. Um, we also run our fulfillment centers uh, out of more local regions. So uh, you can imagine the fulfillment centers that are in Asia are running out of uh, in-region uh, AWS sites. So they all scale differently. Uh, but your core question is the right one, which is like, how big is this? Uh, what I can tell you is we said, you know, first off, from a business perspective, we start planning six months in advance. And we have to line this up with all our vendors for all of the things that we're going to sell. We have to go get all of those deals inked. We have to figure out how all the third parties are going to work. So there's a lot of business planning that goes into this. Uh, and as part of that, 
we gather up our scaling plans for AWS very early and we share them with AWS up to six months in advance. So AWS is planning their normal forecasted growth to support all customers and we're layering in what we think that uplift is gonna look like. So we have many months with AWS to get ready for that. We certainly can't pretend that an event of that magnitude is something that just is sitting there waiting for us, right? So um, what's different I think for other enterprise customers is you won't have maybe as big a scale up event um, but there's still lead time for very, very large uh, amounts of capacity. And so for us, I think that lead time is much longer than the normal enterprise customer might see. Um, but that's all part of what we're doing to make sure this all goes smoothly for all our customers, not just for uh, Amazon as a customer of AWS. And on the AWS side too, we, um, we have operational <coughs> reviews and we keep a, a support calendar for infrastructure event management across all major customers as well. So we're tracking all the peak events for everything. Um, so whether it's, it's Netflix, it's Amazon.com, everyone's treated as a unique customer with a large peak event and we plan accordingly. And that's actually been interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, obviously for Cyber Monday, we have, uh, in that Thanksgiving week, we have lots of customers who are scaling for various reasons, uh, some in retail, some for other reasons. So they're, that's, we're, that's all being coordinated. But now that Prime Day has caught on, some of our competitors are following suit in the retail markets, mm -hmm. right? And so we're starting to see other retail companies have a you know, Christmas and July sale, if you will. And so uh, that too is something that we look at across AWS to make sure that all of those customers are ready to go and not just Amazon.com. Hey, you, you rely heavily on uh, reserved instances, uh, but it's a one-time event, so don't you end up with a lot of unused reserved instances after the event? Can you say that for me one more time? I apologize, I didn't hear it very well. Y you rely heavily on reserved instances. Yeah. Uh, don't you end up with a lot of unused, unused reserved instances after the event? Gotcha, gotcha. So. Uh, we, we do, we rely heavily on reserved instances. Um, we've got a couple of different things that we do there. One is, uh, as we go back and look at this, the regular growth you saw that was still happening, we're able to consume a bunch of those ourselves in the weeks that follow uh, the big event. The other thing is, as we coordinate with EC2, EC2 knows roughly how much we're gonna be done with when it's all over, and they're able to use that to offset future orders as well. Uh, but we do, uh, for any capacity that the retail business buys, they still receive the bill for that uh, until we're able to find reuse for it. Um, uh, do you guys have a feature freeze on the Amazon.com size during that time, or do new deployments keep rolling through? <sighs> That's a good question. We have um, uh, something that we call gray and black days. Um, these are days that we don't allow deployments in the, about the final month leading up to our big events. And it's not every day. Um, it has to do with, uh, you know, different other things that are going on in the calendar. So um, we try to have all of our major features finished up a month or so in advance, I think. Um, but I don't believe we straight up have a feature freeze. Not 100% sure on that, because I'm actually on the AWS side of the business, helping the retail side of the business. Uh, but I don't, I don't believe so. But we do, like I said, have... Uh, days leading up um, in, that, in that last month where we have uh, just deployment freezes in general. Um, everything fails all the time, so do you plan for AWS service outages in a region? And if so, what is your plan? So uh, we've architected the Amazon website uh, to follow our best practice of using three availability zones of capacity in all of our regions. And so um, for us, we're able to sustain an outage of any one full availability zone, as well as lose uh, a random server or a rack in any other availability zone and still have the site continue to function. Um, that's all baked into how we do our architecture and how we do our scaling. Uh, but we do have our, uh, our sites themselves are all uh, regional to where they are. So if for some reason, heaven forbid, we lost all of uh, US East 1, we would have an outage on Amazon.com. Would you be able to share some of the best practices that you follow, um, especially when things go wrong, both on the uh, organizational side and the technical side of things? Yeah, I think um, we're going we're gonna, to, and we'll have kind of a few takeaways at the end, but I'll try and go a little deeper here. I think one of the most important things we do is this readiness review process that we described. Um, and this is really about making sure, as much as anything, that everyone understands what their dependencies are, what services they're dependent upon, and what's going on with those services. Uh, and through that process, and through bringing all of those service owners together for regular reviews, it helps reestablish connections with, you know, maybe new people are on teams, people who've moved around, changed roles. It helps reestablish those connections so that we know when there's an event, who are the people we need to get a hold of? Uh, and then running that live call that we do for our big events 
uh, is another way where we have all of the engineers there in real time and everybody's able to work together very, very quickly and efficiently. It's I wouldn't say rare, but we try not to find ourselves in a situation where we have to page in somebody. We try to have all the right players there all the time. And then when we do have to page somebody in, as part of our preparation, we make sure that all the pager aliases are up to date, everybody's got their on-call schedules posted, that stuff is already in place as well. Um, so it's really about cutting down the amount of time it takes to find the people who know what's going on. Um, now I can say I've been doing this for six years. I've been through 10 of these big events between Black Fridays and Cyber Mondays and, and, uh, and Prime Days, and we have in the past had some outages, uh, and you never know what's gonna, what's gonna cause it, and when you start trying to solve it, you don't know what the fix is gonna be, like, like any of, uh, you know, outage or event you guys have all been through. Um, but having all of the right people and having a leader who's, who's been there and who knows how to run an outage call, how to be, remain calm, keep everybody on track, keep everybody focused, makes all the difference in the world. You know, one thing I, I think might be worth adding is on, on the development side, we um, have a series of um, risk mitigation levers as well. So each team is responsible for documenting um, what steps they might do to shut down certain services in case there's an issue or, or how they might, what paths they might follow in case there's an issue or outage as well. I think the biggest thing in all of that is that we've learned to expect that there will be problems and to have plans in place ahead of time so we know what we're going to do. Um, that, that process of meeting together regularly is, uh, and, and conducting those game days that we do beforehand, that's a dress rehearsal, right? And that's an opportunity, I can tell you in our game days, things fail all the time. Uh, and that's, that's our opportunity to find bugs, to find problems, tweak and tune, get everything you know, back where we want it. And so uh, through that dress rehearsal process, we're all comfortable and familiar with what to look for and how to react. Something else we do as well is, um, Enterprise support gets involved with these events, but we also engage um, solution architects. We, we, we've been using um, AWS professional services. Like for example, we did a whole series of DynamoDB workshops and deep dives across 5,000 different developers. And um, through that process, we found, I think it was like 2,800 different DynamoDB tables that could potentially have a throttling issue. And just by working with teams proactively, we, start, we were able to address those things up front and mitigate risk. Um, so uh, as you guys scale up for Prime Day, um, do you guys account for uh, an instance churn where whether it's for uh, basic hygiene where you're killing instances or whether it's because they're not acting the way they should be? Is there a certain percentage of churn that you expect and, and then you account for it? You bet. Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, what, what, the way that works uh, at Amazon is, as I mentioned before, all of our teams are responsible for their own service, they're responsible for their own capacity, and they have complete ownership of the health of all of that. Um, our best practice is that your service is resilient and it can handle the failure of a host here or a host there, and can either quickly recover, auto-scale back up to where it needs to be, uh, you know, you have all the right alerts and alarms in place, that's, that's our best practice. Now, the reality is, is sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes a team doesn't follow the best practice or they think they followed it, but they didn't set everything up quite right. Uh, and we end up with an instance where if somebody's service becomes degraded because we've lost a host. Uh, hopefully we find those kind of things in our game day processes and in the lead up to these big events. Um, but during the event, one of the things you saw there is we add capacity uh, really throughout the day. Uh, you remember in that graph, the, the day of, there's a big bump there where we launch on-demand capacity, and that's a big part of what my team is there for. So when we're going through the events, teams start noticing that they're running hot or that their queues are starting to build, uh, they're starting to become a bottleneck, we can jump in and immediately and quickly add more capacity to make sure they're able to keep up with the load and stay ahead of what's happening or recover if they're starting to fall behind. So, uh, so hopefully we've all designed our stuff that it's resilient to that, but if we find ourselves in a situation where some service is starting to struggle, we'll just top them up with more capacity and get them healthy again. Hi. Um, on that slide where you had a bunch <coughs> of uh, stats uh, related to Prime Day, I believe it said uh, 24,000 accounts, AWS accounts. 24,866. Yeah, can, um, so that really is what popped <laughs> up. When we wrote that, actually, slide. I think it said 33,000 now. <laughs> it, what, and then I remember, and then there's 18,000 developers. So I'm just trying to figure out how, how is it, how are there so many accounts? Like, what is the strategy behind that? Um, it's funny, it's evolved rapidly over the last couple of years. In fact, I think only like 18 months ago, it was, it was closer to like 5,000. So just been growing rapidly. And a lot of that's um, mostly development accounts. They're, they're, they're spinning up quick AWS accounts to do some testing or try out some new feature, and then they, and they spin them back down in some cases. I mean, production itself is probably closer to two or 3,000. Um, 
So that gives you an idea. And of course, you're, when you're dealing with multiple AZs and you're, you're doing low bouncing, sometimes you might use multiple accounts. So there's, and it's something we're kind of evolving and kind of seeing how it goes right now. Um, we, we, I've, I know enterprise customers that use um, 10,000 accounts. I know enterprise customers use six. So it, it, do, it does vary in terms of approach. Uh, during these game day events that you guys kind of run, how do you simulate uh, traffic flows on the kind of scale that, that you expect uh, during those kind of peak hours? You bet. I'm not a deep expert in this, uh, and I think there's a couple of other tech talks where you, the, the, the folks there might be able to give you some better data on it. Um, there's a couple of things I'm aware of that we do. One is that we have uh, created the ability, uh, like in our databases, to take logs and replay them uh, against our uh, against our database and our backend tier. So we can use that as a way to stress test that system. We can you know, take a set of logs and run them against it while it's taking real-time traffic. Uh, we can replay that and create artificial traffic. Um, the other thing we do is we have the capability of uh, shifting traffic to a smaller part of the fleet, which simulates its share of the load of a full set of traffic, right? So if you imagine we take 100,000 and we spread that across 100 machines, we can squeeze that down to 10 and simulate what that bigger load will be. So um, we can do those kinds of things to help direct more traffic to uh, a smaller area to see what kind of load it can sustain. Anyone else? All right, well, we'll give you our uh, top tips and takeaways. So first off, um, plan your event in advance. Uh, AWS is here to help you. Uh, we've got elasticity to support you. We've got capabilities to support you. But you don't want to get lucky like we did in Prime Day 2015. You actually want to execute this flawlessly, right? Uh, the elasticity saved our ability to keep the website running, but that's really not the place we wanted to be. Engage your AWS account team. Talk to them about how you can use the infrastructure event management process and, um, within AWS support. Next, get your services ready. Finish your new features, fix your bugs, test and improve the performance of your, of your software systems. Be sure that they're ready. Conduct readiness reviews. Review your plans with every single team. Make sure everyone knows exactly what's going on and get them talking. And then, of course, use your solution architects to do well architecture reviews. I can't emphasize that enough. Hold game days. Test everything together. If you can't do that, if your software stack doesn't work that way, at least uh, get everybody together around a table and do a paper exercise. Walk through and talk about uh, what are you going to do if you figure out that a piece of your software is going to be a bottleneck? Because I guarantee you one of them will be. Do your teams know how to contact one another? Do they know who their dependencies are upstream and downstream? Um, practice for failure. Do, you know, who do you call? Uh, who is, uh, who's your on your call your, uh, sorry, who's on your on-call list? Does everyone have the right uh, contact information? Are all the pager aliases up to date? Like, all of that stuff seems very simple basic hygiene, but over the course of a year when you maybe haven't had a large event, it drifts. Uh, so make sure you practice that. Make sure you talk about it. Um, and the last thing I can say on your game days, um, descale things you don't need to run your production workload, whatever that might be. Um, one, I will tell you, those things can be a distraction. Um, you've got other software running, some alarm fails on some piece of software that's totally not involved in your event. Engineers get distracted, like just don't have the bother. Two, it's gonna give you some extra capacity that you can use if you need it for your production workloads. And three, it's a potential to save yourself some money. And of course, as Brian mentioned earlier, run an event war room. Um, have all the parties in one location or on one call and also engage your um, technical account manager and enterprise support to have them on that call as well. And the last thing I'd say is use your event as a training ground for the unexpected. Don't waste the opportunity to find out how your software performs under load, how your team performs under pressure. Uh, do people know what to do? Do we, do we know how to react? Um, this is an opportunity for you to learn about how your customers are gonna behave in these events, and that can make your software and your teams more efficient and more resilient, not just for the next big event, but for your day-to-day -day operations as well. That's all we have for you today. Thanks very much. Hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.